they say things like, why do, you, why do you want everyone to have a gun? Guns are designed to kill. Why would you want more of them? If you didn't talk about guns so much, more people would support you. And then the killer one is, just look at America. That's all you need to know about guns. Now, those of us who are familiar with guns, and I assume that's all of you here, already have answers to those questions, but most people don't. In fact, very few people have much of a clue about the current gun laws at all. What you can legally own and what you can legally use. And, and, uh, and they have no idea uh, how they would change the laws. If you actually ask, how would you change the laws, they nearly always propose something that is all, already the law. And if you ask them to describe the gun laws in America, all they know is what they see on the news, on the TV or in the movies, which in any case, which in case you need reminding is fiction, including the news. And yet, ignorant or not, that's what drives our public policy. Now, Hitler's master of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, said, a lie told once remains a lie. But a lie told a thousand times becomes the truth. That's where we're at today with gun laws in Australia. They're based on lies. They're told so frequently that the public believes it to be the truth. And that if we didn't have our current gun laws, we would end up just like America. That's what most of the public believe. It's why we face steady encroachment on what remains of our right to shoot and own guns via the National Firearms Agreement. Why a group of gun-hating bureaucrats in the Attorney General's Department can influence an ignorant and not very smart Minister for Justice to slowly but surely restrict what we can own and use. It's why so many of our politicians, even those who are supposedly sympathetic to us, say their policy is to accept the NFA as long as it doesn't get any worse. It explains why the, New, uh, the police minister in New South Wales, who is himself a keen sporting shooter, can't do anything to improve the situation. He's outnumbered by people who believe what I, all those uh, lines I just ran past you. Now, I don't believe in conspiracies. When there's a choice between a conspiracy and a cock-up, I choose the cock-up every time. Conspiracies require planning, organisation and a modicum of intelligence. And you'll never get all three of those when it comes to governments. But you can get a shared common belief. And when it comes to gun control, that common belief is the same one John Howard stated in 1996 when he forced the states to adopt his National Firearms Agreement. He said on Radio 2GB in Sydney, <coughs> We will find any means we can to re further restrict them because I hate guns. I don't think people should have guns unless they are the police, in the military or security industry. Ordinary citizens should not have weapons. We do not want the American disease imported into Australia. Now prior to Howard, nobody talked about disarmament. The argument was only ever about preventing harm. But the agenda of those who work in the Attorney General's Department in Canberra, who wrote the National Firearms Agreement, is disarmament. Like the Fabians who believe in gradual conversion to socialism, they are working slowly and surely towards their end goal, when only the government has guns. I suspect most of you know the facts here, but for those who don't, I'll run through a few. If gun control was effective, the countries with the most stringent gun laws would have the least level of violence. Or conversely, a lack of gun control would lead to gun violence. And many people point to the US to argue that point. But countries like New Zealand, Canada, Switzerland and the Czech Republic have far less stringent gun laws than we have in Australia. And yet their murder rates are pretty much the same as ours. According to Howard's logic, they should have higher levels than us. In fact, the gun laws in the Czech Republic are quite similar to many in the American states. It's easy to obtain a gun, and it's not difficult to obtain a permit for concealed carry either. And yet their murder rate is no different from ours. 
In America, the states and cities with the most stringent gun laws have the most violence, the worst gun violence. In Chicago and Washington DC, for, for example, it's virtually impossible to legally obtain a gun, and yet they have gun violence far higher than parts of the country where guns are barely restricted at all. In the state of Vermont, for example, you don't need a license of any description. Almost everyone has a gun, and yet it's safer than Australia. Why is this so? There are all sorts of theories, and I don't know which is best. I've heard it said quite often that if drugs were legalised, the level of violence would immediately plummet. But I, I don't feel obliged to offer an alternative. All I can do is point out what are known facts. There's no doubt, though, that taking America as a whole, Americans do kill each other more than people in many other countries. But their murder rate without guns is substantially higher, even compared to countries like Australia when guns are included. So it might be more accurate to say America has a murder culture rather than a gun culture. On the other hand, countries which have gun laws similar to those in America do not. Switzerland and the Czech Republic show this clearly. America is different. You can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own facts. The bottom line is, there is simply no correlation between gun control and murder rates. You cannot look at gun laws in a country and make a prediction about its murder rate. And finally, on this America versus Australia comparison, I want to briefly deal with this frequently heard statement. Since the gun laws were introduced, there haven't been any massacres. It's a straight out lie. Since 1996, there have been 16 mass shootings in Australia. Of these, six involved two victims, five involved three victims, and five involved four or more victims. Those who promote this story keep clinging to the notion, the definition of a massacre, the notion that a massacre requires a certain number of people to be dead before it qualifies as a massacre. Only recently I heard they want to make it five or more victims in order to be able to say there hasn't been a massacre in Australia. And of course, as I said, they have to all be dead. If a dozen people were shot and wounded by a, a machine gun in Burke Street, but nobody died, it wouldn't qualify as a massacre. Finally, there's this notion that only the government can be trusted to own guns. That unless we have a badge or a uniform granted by the state, you and I shouldn't be allowed to have a gun. Or if we are allowed to have a gun, it's viewed as a privilege rather than a right. So strict conditions are imposed, such as the type of gun, the calibre, the magazine capacity, how many guns you can own and what you can do with them. And if it's a privilege, it's obviously something that can be taken away as well. How you view that depends on your perception of the government and its relationship to us as individuals. Is the government like our parent, not only in charge, but keeping us safe from bad people and bad things? And given it can't always know who the bad people are, is keeping guns away from anyone not under the government's control the best way to keep us safe? Or are we adults, largely responsible for our own safety? And the government is there to serve us, rather than the other way around. Does the government give us our rights and can take them away from us if it likes? Or do we have rights that we are born with, which the government should never try to take away, including the right to protect ourselves? I believe the latter is true to others. Clearly, we are not hurting anyone by owning a gun any more than we are hurting anyone by owning a cigarette lighter or a chainsaw. We accept the state should enforce the criminal law via the police and the courts, but freedom-minded people like me accept personal responsibility. We never agreed to relinquish responsibility for our safety, our protection, to the state, to the government. Now, since 1997 in Australia, we have been forbidden from carrying anything for self-defence. Our legal right to self-defence is clear. 
but having the practical means is prohibited. If you are skilled at martial arts, or you happen to be a chef carrying your knife to and from work, you might be fine. But most people, especially women and the elderly, are defenceless. It's illegal to carry out an implement specifically for self-defense. I'm not suggesting everyone should carry a gun. They're not for everyone. And even in countries where they can be legally carried, less than 10% do so. But I am suggesting you should have the right to do so, if you wish, provided you're competent and not a violent person. And I'm also suggesting that everyone should have a right to non-lethal means of self-defence, such as a taser, pepper spray or mace, if they wish, without, without requiring anyone's permission. Unfortunately, it seems I'm the only politician advocating for a return of our right to self-defence. Nobody else seems to be taking up the issue, despite the fact that it is the only aspect of gun control that is relevant to the overwhelming majority of people. Most people couldn't care less about our sport, our hunting or our collecting, but everyone, everyone cares about their own safety and that of their families. If we're going to make gun control relevant to the general public, it will be self-defence, the argument about self-defence that wins them over, not telling them that we are just nice people and don't do any harm. And to finish, I want to raise an important point that's rarely considered in the debate about gun laws. If we don't have the right to use our own judgment in relation to practical self-defence, how can we possibly be trusted to vote? Isn't electing the government, with all the power it has, a far greater responsibility? I view our enforced victim status, legally prevented from having the means to defend ourselves, as a profound threat to freedom and democracy. And we are losing the fight to prevent it happening. Australia's gun laws don't reduce violence. That's no surprise. They don't in any other country either. They don't reduce suicides either, although they might change the means. What they do do is reinforce state power over us as individuals and create a position of dependency on the state which undermines our democracy. Here endeth the lesson. Now, I don't... It appears that the agenda here is rather relaxed, so I don't think anyone is waiting to speak after me. So if anybody has any questions, um, I'm here for another five or ten minutes. So if you want to ask me a question now, you can. Otherwise, I'll be over at the Liberal Democrat stand for a couple of hours after this. So. How do you, uh, break, the, how do you break the cycle of people being annoying about uh, the differentiation between a law-abiding firearms owner and people who they think that gun control laws only relate to the importation of illegal firearms. I've noticed that that's a big, a big block for people. Yeah. So, so the question is, uh, uh, how do how do we distinguish between us law-abiding people and uh, and illegal importers and uh, other people who break the law? Um, a lot of people spend a lot of time on that, for saying it's not us, it's the criminals. We don't break the law, we're good people, we're law-abiding people. Um, it's, you should be focusing on the criminals. I'm not suggesting that argument is wrong, misplaced, erroneous or anything. I don't happen to believe it's a winnable argument though. I don't think the public gives a rats about that kind of argument. I think the public um, is indifferent to us. Most, public, most of the public don't shoot. I am totally supportive of what we're doing here at the SHOT Show, getting people to have a try of shooting and realise that nobody dies, nobody gets hurt, it's good fun, and it actually takes quite a lot of skill. I'm totally in favour of that. But with all the best intentions in the world, we are not going to reach the vast majority of the public. What will the public relate to? their safety. And we have an ageing population and who cares most about their safety? Older people. 
people my age and older. They worry. They're, statistically, they're less likely to be uh, threatened. But that's not how they see it. They see their safety as a major concern. And every time I speak in public about the fact that, no, you're not allowed to have a knife. You're not allowed to carry a knife in your handbag or in your, in your pocket. No, you, you, you can't do that. You're not allowed to have pepper spray. You're not allowed to have mace. You're not allowed to have a pointy stick. Nothing at all for your self-defence. You will be uh, charged with, with carrying an offensive weapon if that's what you do. They go, that can't be right. That cannot be true. Now, they've got no interest in guns, most of them, and yet they have a great deal of interest in their own safety. Now, my view is that we as shooting, as a shooting community, are missing a major opportunity to turn around public attitudes towards us. And you look at what has happened in America. The National Rifle Association has, is enormously successful, enormously influential, the most powerful lobby group in, in America. And what issue have they carried uh, or have they ridden to that status? It's self-defence. Self-defence is the winnable argument. There's a question just towards the front here. Yes, sir. Yourself? Are you a gun owner yourself? Yeah, yeah. I've got a safe full of them. Uh, there's a man over there who wants to ask a question. Uh, g'day. Um, back in the early 90s, I, I remember that um, the government changed the law in regards to using a firearm for protection. Uh, can you see that actually changing in the future in regards to protecting oneself and family? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of your question. Back in the early 90s, from memory, I, I remember that you were allowed to use a firearm for protection yes. in regards to your home and property. Yes. And the government changed that ruling. That's right. Can you see that ruling changing in the near future in regards to protecting family and property? In the near future, no. Um, you're quite right. Prior to 1996, most states, if not all, had provision for people who are facing what the Americans call clear and present danger, um, you know, an imminent threat, would under some circumstances be granted a permit for a gun, to have a gun. Um, sometimes, quite frequently, the people wouldn't take up that offer. The police would suggest it to them. Um, fre people frequently would, would uh, uh, not take up that offer because they didn't know how to use a gun, which I think was fair enough too. But uh, those who did, those who wanted to learn how to use one, would be granted a permit. When the, when the danger was over, so the, you know, the, the threatening part, ex-partner or crazed stalker or whatever it was had gone away, the permit would be uh, re removed and the gun would have to be uh, relinquished. But um, it was a practical means by which people could take some responsibility for their own safety. The 1996 gun laws removed that entirely by, by agreement, by the COAG agreement and the National Firearms Agreement. Now, are we ever going to get it back again? We, I, don't, I don't think we are. Enlist support from people who have no interest in guns but have a great deal of interest in their personal safety and uh, get them to join in the debate. And uh, we need friends in the shooting community. We, only, we are less than, what, 5% of the population. Uh, we need allies and friends. Any more? Uh, one more? Uh, hi, um, I was just wondering now that Mark Latham's joined your party, would that... I know he doesn't see eye to eye with you in regards to, to gun rights and gun policy, etc. Would that have any change in the party <coughs> policy in regards to firearms, etc.? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, Mark is not convinced that our gun policy is, um, is the right policy. Um, it's important to understand that anyone can join our party. We don't ask you what your views are on anything before you join the party. You, if you want to sign up and pay the money, you can become a member. So uh, obviously Mark is in that category. He's not on the executive, he's not a candidate, and you know he just happens to be a high profile member. We've got 7,000 members, so he's, he's you know, in a big crowd. Um, the, the significance is that he has attracted attention to the Liberal Democratic Party, which is, which is good, welcome, it's always difficult to get attention, and uh, raises our profile. 
Um, he wants to be helpful and constructive, um, and we welcome that. And as it stands, he's basically saying, well, let's just not talk about guns. Um, I'll agree to disagree with you. A couple of our members have taken that as a bit of a challenge in order to uh, educate him. And uh, so give me six months or give us six months and we'll see whether Mark holds the same views. It's, it's quite likely that, like most people who are anti-gun, his views are based on a very small amount of information. And once he has a lot more information, hopefully he will realise that uh, he was uh, perhaps uh, a little hasty in his views. Say again. Yeah. It's Mark's uh, uh, very welcome addition to the party. He has a high profile. He can talk about the party. A lot, of, lot more people know about the Liberal Democrats than did before. He also knows a lot of people who are uh, high profile as well, uh, having been leader of the Labor Party. Uh, and in fact, you know, if he'd won the election in 2004, he would have been Prime Minister. So, you know, he has a high profile. Uh, he's a um, access to the media that uh, that I don't have and uh, that's all very positive so uh, he is very supportive of the party he's not talking about guns at all and uh, we are welcoming the attention that he's bringing uh, hi is there any room in the party for members of um, that that don't think along those lines and and um, you well know, against gun ownership long term we, well, as I said, we don't ask you what your views are before you join the party. So, you know, we don't know, of the 7,000 people we have in the party, we don't know what all their views are on guns. What we do have, though, is some principles and policies. And when you sign up to become a member of the party, you agree to, be, to, be, to abide by them. We have a rule which says if you don't agree with any of our policies, you don't criticise it in public but it's not compulsory to agree with it in private. That's as far as we take it. So there we have people who agree with 60, 70% of our policies, others who agree with 90%. Not very many people would agree with 100% anyway. So, uh, um, you know, we're happy to take them um, on it, whatever terms they like. If they are damaging to the party, they cause us harm, they get chucked out. That's, that's the Just on ultimate. Thinking it's not not likely that Mark Latham would, disagree, uh, would have private thoughts about something he dis didn't disagree with. Yeah. Well, privately he can talk about what he likes. It's publicly that I'm concerned about. All right. Thank you very much. I hope that was informative.